When pilot Chris Prophet of Muckleteo, Washington, got into an aircraft and took off from Payne Field in Everett, Washington, on Saturday, it was already a pretty profound day. That's because his passenger, the woman sitting next to him, was his wife, Tricia, and she had not flown in five years. Tricia was about to face her fear of flying. The Prophets flew to nearby Snohomish and its airport, Harvey Field, which is just down the road from here. After about an hour at Harvey Field, where the Prophets watched tandem skydivers, the Prophets got back into the aircraft and they took off, going south. But they didn't get very far. Before you knew it, they were making a crash landing in this farm field behind me, right alongside Highway 9. It was quite an ordeal for sure. Certainly, Trisha Prophet was extremely shaken. Her husband had been solely focused on getting that aircraft somehow safely back on the ground. Today I spoke with Chris Prophet. He shared his story in great detail. And rather than edit that interview down to about a minute or two or the length of a television news story, I've decided to let you see it pretty much unedited. After all, this channel is beyond 90 seconds. So here is the story right from Chris Prophet about how this whole thing resulted into the plane in the farm field and the really amazing result where two people walked away largely unscathed. So uh, we, were, uh, we were just kind of sitting around and I thought we should go do something fun at the house. And so I uh, have been trying to get Trisha to uh, fly with me. She hasn't flown with me since 2017 because she's not a huge fan of flying. So I said, well, why don't we just go to Payne Field? We'll get in the plane. We'll taxi over to the, to the uh, fuel pumps, get some fuel and taxi back, just get you into the plane and get used to being around it. And we don't even have to fly today. So she said, yeah, I can do that. And then uh, we said, well, we'll see how you're feeling. And if you feel good, we'll go for a flight. If you don't, we won't go flight. No pressure. So we went to the airport. She goes, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the fuel pump. She goes, no, let's just go ahead and go. I, I, I can do this. I can fly. So I'm like, okay, let's go. So we went, uh, we took off from Payne and just headed east over to Harvey Field and went in, made our landing. We stopped there and uh, sat out at the, uh, the, the restaurant there at Harvey Field and watched the skydivers for a little bit. And then we went ahead and decided to come on back. And uh, so uh, I did the walk around the plane and uh, I strained the fuel, the fuel uh, tanks again. And um, we did our run up, everything was fine. There was no indication of any problems. And then I got out on the runway. I wanted to make sure before I took off that we were gonna have full power. So I held the brakes to do like a short field takeoff, gave it full power. We had full RPMs, manifold pressure was good. All the engine gauges looked good, everything was fine. So I had it let off on the brakes and we took off and everything was fine until uh, we got about I don't know, about a little under set. Well, about right about 700 feet, and the engine just kind of petered out on us. It just stopped running, and then it kind of revved up, and it was kind of uh, going back and forth. And so I thought, well, I might be able to, you know, f fly this thing back. I thought maybe we'd have enough power, but it just finally just there was no power. And so um, I looked over. There was a hill right in front of us, so I knew I couldn't go straight ahead, which is what you typically want to do. You don't want to make a turn. There's a Think about doing the 180 where, you know, most people, most pilots die doing that because you end up losing um, airspeed and spinning into the ground. So you don't really want to do that. So I made a gradual right hand turn headed west and saw Highway 9 there. And I was going to try to make Highway 9. I figured if I could get over it, I'd make my turn and treat it just like a runway. But as I was approaching it, I knew I wasn't going to make that. And so I had to start my, my final, uh, as it were, your final approach. Uh, to the the cornfield or whatever it was and so that's what we did and we landed we actually landed and hit a uh, kind of a it was an upward berm like this and so it sent us flying back up in the air again we flew about another hundred yards and then landed a second time and then we rolled for a while the 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 nose wheel broke off and then we just the the plane went right into the ground and came to a sudden stop I was just looking at the thing, it went from 40 miles an hour to zero in like one second. Just came to an abrupt halt and we sat there and she was freaking out a little bit. <laughs> so I put my arm around her and I said, hey, we're okay, we're alive, we need to get out of the plane. And so we just, we hopped out of the plane, jumped out pretty quick and got out and looked around and everything was fine. The, the, the plane was actually in pretty good condition, none of the fuel tanks were damaged, there was no fuel 
So I turned off all the fuel and all that junk before we got out of the plane, make sure that you know there wasn't any uh, issue of fire and all of that. So. So that was the sense of urgency once you came to a stop was we got to get out. Got yeah. Out. At first it was like, oh my God, this just happened. And we're okay. We're both alive. We're good. And she's freaking out. So I, my first thought was to make her feel better. And then I thought, oh shit, we got to get out of the plane. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> so I thought, man, we got to get out of the plane. So. Yeah, I just said, let's get out. And she's like, grab our bags. I'm like, no, I'm not grabbing nothing. Get out of the plane. <laughs> let's talk about what a momentous uh, day this was for, the, for your wife in particular to yeah. begin with. Because when she was at Payne Field and you were simply going to settle for taxiing at Payne Field, she said, no, let's go for it. That was a real big moment for her to make that declaration. Oh, yeah. Because she's had anxiety about flying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she she uh, is by nature a pretty anxious person, and so she always tries to push herself. And so she's like, "No, I got to do this. I'm going to have a victory today. I'm going to fly with you. We can do this." And and I'm thinking, oh, "It's going to be great. We'll get her up in this plane, and she's going to love it, and it'll be a great time for her, and I'll make her feel safe again." <laughs> yeah. You talked about the. Well, let me follow up with that. How is your wife doing now? Is it still rattling? Yeah, it, I you know it's I think it's really traumatic to her. Um, for her, she thought she was going to die, and with that plane, I had to come in pretty steep and fast to keep the speed up. And so we were dropping, and I'm sure to somebody who's not used to being in a plane that it probably looked like we were diving into the ground. I don't know, but she was she was pretty freaked out. She she said that she she knew she was going to die, and all she could think about were her kids. So she's pretty traumatized by it more than I am. To me, it wasn't, I don't know why. I kind of figured if I ever got in this situation, I would be really nervous or afraid. I wasn't sure how I'd react, but I mean, it was like, it was nothing. It was just like, okay, we're going to land. No, my heart didn't even pound, my adrenaline. Even after we got stopped, it was totally fine. But for, but for her not being used to flying, yeah, she was, she's struggling right now. But she'll get through it. It's just going to take a while. Have you been flying for about 20 years? No, I've been flying longer than that. I started flying up in Alaska. I actually soloed when I was 15. Back in the day, they didn't really require much proof for, uh, for your birth, so I was able to fly uh, earlier than what I should have been. But I worked for a, um, a place up in Anchorage, Melridge Aviation, as a ramp rat, and so they taught me how to fly. And I've always had a passion for flying, but I didn't get my license until I was 19. So you've been it's flying for a lot of years? Long time, yeah. But there's been years where I've gone many years without flying because, you know, things that were going on, whether it was financial or whatever, you know, I couldn't afford it. But um, uh, so we did take a break at times, you know, but yeah, I've been, had an early start at it. Tell us about the make and model of plane that you have and the particular challenge that might have uh, presented because it's a heavier a larger plane than yeah some. yeah it's called a pa32 300 or it's known like uh as a cherokee six it's a six seven seater um and had, this particular one had had a 300 horsepower constant speed prop three bladed prop so really heavy in the front but they have a ton of power they're they are like they are um uh e extremely good haulers um they have a, about like 1500 pound payload it's pretty crazy, so or useful load rather, and um, so um, that being said, because it is so heavy, it when when you lose power, it comes down pretty fast. So you don't have a lot of time to sit and glide around and think about things. So yeah, that's that's what I can say. You about mentioned that. on the phone that a few seconds here or there could have made a world of difference. Could you tell me specifically what you were, what you were telling me earlier? <laughs> well, I was just thankful that we had the altitude we did. I mean, if we were at like two or 300 feet, that could have been really bad, uh, especially because there was a hill in front of us. Um, so, yeah, I'm, j I'm just glad we, that we had, that it, that it quit when it, when it did. You know, if it would have been earlier, it could have been a lot worse for sure. Seems like even given the way things played out in terms of altitude and the way the engine behaved, it didn't respond. Had this been taking off from Payne Field, where there are no open farm fields, that could have presented a lot of problems too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I usually fly off uh, 
the, the smaller runway at Payne Field, and I've already kind of mapped out where I would land in case of an, uh, an engine out uh, on both runways. So I kind of have a sense of where I would go if I had the time. But yeah, I mean, I'm really thankful that it happened where it did. I mean, Snohomish is like the best place it could possibly happen. You have nothing but farmlands all around you. So that was a good thing. If it would have been Makotillo, that, that could have been bad. So to be clear, you didn't land on Highway 9 because you just ran out of altitude? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to make it. We would, we would have been way too low. So I just uh, decided. I knew when I went over to Highway 9 to try to make it, I knew it wasn't my last option. Like, I knew I had two options. I could either hit Highway 9, which was what I was going for because I wanted to land in the pavement, on the pavement rather than in the dirt. But I knew that if I couldn't make it, I could hit the dirt. And so I just started heading that direction. And once I realized that we weren't going to make it, then I made my right-hand turn and just decided to turn before Highway 9 rather than wait till I was, you know, near to where I could actually uh, approach it for landing. When you say you make your right-hand turn, it almost makes it sound like you went from south to going west. But you hung on to that right-hand turn to the point where you were almost, you're going basically northwest. Yeah, when we touched down, we were going north. I mean, we were full north when, when we, I mean, it, yeah, we, we did pretty much a 180, but it was over a, a long period of time, and um, I knew I wasn't going to make the airport, so it wasn't one of those um, 180s, which a lot of guys will do, where they try to do a real steep turn, you know, so they don't lose altitude. I did a very gradual turn, knowing I wasn't going to make the airport, but I needed to get over to this other field, so that's kind of how it ended up, but the last... Last bit of that turn was right before touchdown. I mean, if you go back and look at the tracks, we definitely touched down on the on the um, right hand wheel first. You can see it in the. So we were still just coming out of the turn right, right as we were coming. To the, it was like a fighter pilot approach. <laughs> <laughs> you have an app that shows your your you know your progress and then where, how things ended up. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the. It sounds like it's a well known app with pilots and tell me what it does. Yeah, so it's called ForeFlight and it's it's just an app that pilots can use on their iPhone or i uh, iPads and it provides um, a bunch of uh, aviation services like navigation. You can get ADSB where you can watch um, traffic surrounding traffic around you. You can get weather on it. I mean, it's like. Uh, it's, it's really cool. So basically, every time you take a flight, it records your flight. And um, so the flight was actually recorded. So I, I can look at the airspeed. I can look at the altitude. We can see exactly how long I was. And we, we watched it actually when, when you first got here. And from the time the engine quit to the time we touched down was roughly 40 seconds. So you had 40 seconds of no engine whatsoever. That's what it looks like. Uh, it felt like it felt like five seconds at the time, but <laughs> watching it when we were sitting here watching, I'm like, it didn't seem that. This is taking a long time because when when it was happening, it seemed like it was like. So that stopping and starting that you experienced was prior to this final forty seconds where you were just literally riding on air. Yeah, it was just. I mean, it was right then. You can actually see where you start to. I can you start. You can see where I start slowing down, and then the altitude kind of sits there and it dips a little bit, and then it just starts. As we get closer and closer, the altitude just starts bleeding off. Prior to this interview, after I arrived here today, you said something that, you know, hearing from others, it sounds like a lot of pilots or most pilots don't survive this type of scenario. Well, yeah, I don't know about, yeah, and I don't know if it's most, because um, I, don't, I don't know the real numbers, but um, I think, in my opinion, as a pilot, the worst time to lose your engine is on takeoff. I mean, that is the absolute worst. You're in, a, you're in the most vulnerable position. You're at a, a high bank or excuse me, a high uh, attitude. Um, you're going slower speed. Uh, so, you know, if your engine quits, your plane is going to slow down extremely fast unless you drop the nose immediately. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of guys, you know, they don't do that and they will lose lift and they'll stall and spin into the ground. And so in my brain, I was just like, the, the minute I, I mean, I, it was honestly the second I heard my engine having trouble and I felt the, the, the loss of our thrust, I immediately just put the nose down, looked at my, um, sp my um, um, speedometer and just kept it going to 100 miles. And on that plane, 100 miles an hour is the best glide speed for that plane. So I just kept, I tried to keep it at 100 miles an hour. So I knew we weren't going to stall. So once I had the plane trimmed and we were flying, um, then it was just a matter of 
maintaining it and trying to find where I was going to put the put it down. <laughs> Bringing it back to your wife, um, you actually did tell her that she did achieve something in all of that. It wasn't the ideal situation for yeah. her, flight, but she faced her fears. She did, and now she she had her victory, and uh, she's one of the few who has survived an engine out on takeoff and lived to tell about it. So now she's a real warrior. <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. But understandably, she doesn't want to be on camera because this is that's a pretty harrowing experience. Yeah. She's not the pilot. She's yeah. the passenger. Yeah. She's still trying to decompress from it all. Yeah. Um, did your plane sustain any damage as a result of the landing? Yeah. Yeah, but for for um, for what what we went through, the plane actually didn't get that badly damaged. I mean. Um, the only thing that got damaged was the uh, the front landing gear, the front cowling. Uh, the motor's going to have to be gone through because um, there was a prop strike, and so they're going to have to tear it apart and make sure it's okay. So it's going to be a rebuild or a new engine will be needed, and then obviously a new prop, possibly a new hub. But the spinner was fine. The spinner was uh, no, not a scratch on it, which was kind of surprising. Um, but that's about it. The rest of the plane was fine. No damage on the wings, on the underbelly, which really surprised Not even the underbelly of the plane other than the, the front. I mean, there was no other damage that I could see on that plane. So that was good. It was, it was probably the best scenario that we could have hoped for other than uh, not losing our motor at all, our engine. Any idea why the engine failed? No, I have no clue. I still I'm really curious to find out. Um, Right when the right when the engine started to sputter, I immediately went through the the checklist, was, which starts with your fuel system. You know, made sure my richer was my mixture my mixture was full rich. My fuel pump was on. I was on the proper tank. Um, the only thing I really didn't have time to do, which I could have done, was uh, switch tanks, which is one of the things that you can do. But it was it had all happened so fast that I was just trying to, you know, keep the plane from stalling and landing it but that's probably one other thing i could have possibly done is switch tanks i don't know if that would have made a difference or not i'm not sure but uh, i have no idea why it stalled when i did the run-up and i did the mag checks everything was perfect there was nothing nothing wrong at all so yeah i have no idea and it's only the the plane was just at, uh, out of its annual uh a month ago so it was recently annual plane in terms of the investigation right now, there would be the, the, federal, the appropriate federal government agency. I, I'm trying to remember. It's not NHTSA, is it? It's uh, who does? Oh, that? the NTSB. NTSB. Yeah. yeah. NTSB will do an investigation. That's their standard procedure, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I talked to them on the phone yesterday. I had when I was uh, in the field. Uh, I was speaking with. Uh, I was on a conference call with them in the FAA, and um, they just asked me a bunch of questions, and. Um, they didn't send anybody out. They may contact me further, but I don't know to what extent they're going to investigate. I think there's a difference with, no yeah, if like I think there's a difference like if the if the plane has sustained extremely bad damage or um, someone's been injured or killed, there's a different protocol for for engines where the plane's really not that bad. It's not a total necessarily, and there's no injuries, no deaths or anything. I think they have a different protocol. So I don't know how deeply they're going to get into the investigation on it. I don't know. In terms of the engine, do you have it fixed? Do you replace it? Do you fly it? Yeah. What, so, what's the feature look like? Yeah, well, so that's all up to the insurance company because, you know, that plane is worth a certain amount of money, and it's going to need a certain amount of money to get it back to, uh, to normal. And um, so it's up to them. I mean, they can decide to, they can decide to total it. They could decide to put a new motor in, or just have this one rebuilt. Or so, who know? I don't know what they're gonna do. Do you think your wife will fly with you again? <laughs> Prepared for crash landing. Yeah, I don't know. Probably not. I told her today she has a free pass. She's she's one person I'll never give a hard time if they don't want to go flying with me. I always give my friends a hard time. Like, oh, come on and. But I won't do that to her anymore. She 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 has a free pass now. She doesn't have to fly anymore. She has a reason. <laughs> How was the response? You you had sheriff's deputies arriving. Um, I imagine others. You had family members. Um, yeah. It seemed like you definitely had some immediate response. Yeah, it was good. I mean, uh, right when we right when we touched down uh, or got out of the plane, there was a there was uh, a car that stopped on the road immediately and. 
and and said, "Are you guys okay?" You know, and I, I gave him the thumbs up. What's that? A truck from Harvey came. Employee of Harvey came yeah. out on the field. Yeah, one of the. It wasn't an emergency. Yeah, one of the mechanics for Harvey Field came out, and then a couple other guys came out. The guy, the the farmer who leased the land from the the owner of the land came out because I ruined his crop. <laughs> But he was really nice about it. He's like, "Ah, oh, don't worry about it. This is just cow food." So he was he was really cool about it. And uh, the fire, everybody was really good. The police came out and you know made sure everybody was okay. Hmm? No one could really get into. Yeah, it was hard for everyone to get to us because we were right next to Highway Nine. But there's a bit. I think there's like a big ditch, and there's a but. It's almost like hedgerows, you know, all this brush, and then and then there's a. a um, barbed wire fence in between us so there was no way for them to get in so they had to go all the way around to the very back end of the field which i mean i don't know how far it was but it seemed like it was about a mile away uh, it was a ways away and they had to drive their trucks through the field wow um is there anything i haven't asked you that you would like to add hmm not that i can think of can you think of anything I can't think of anything. There were these photos of the two of you and others um, taken at Harvey Field mm -hmm. before taking off? Is that true? Or was it photos of the plane coming in? I'm not sure. Uh, photos? She, had fo she took a couple photos of us uh, when we were at Harvey Field right before we took off. I said, hey, get a photo of me by the plane because I don't have any photos of me standing by the plane. The so she took, a, yeah, she took a photo of me standing by the plane right before we took off. Like, it was probably like 10 minutes before we crashed. And then the other one was uh, a picture of her and I in the cockpit. She did a little selfie while we were coming in for landing at Harvey. And I'm okay to show you in those photos? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then um, the other photos were of my son and his wife getting me. That's the other photo. Yeah, Nathan, our son. In fact, Nathan, the... the uh, the the son yeah he was he was in those photos see he has the black coat on with the hood and he came out and helped us get the plane out of there it was kind of funny because i'd never been in a crash before so when i was on the phone with the uh, ntsb and the uh and faa they're like they're like uh okay well that's all we need thanks and i'm thinking uh i got a quick question for you like i've i've never plashed, uh, crashed a plane before so uh you know i'm thinking like what's your protocol protocol for getting my plane out of here like when are you guys coming to get the plane <laughs> i realize uh they're not they don't do that that's my job <laughs> so anyway um i called the owner of the plane because i don't own the plane i'm part of a club and so this gentleman owns i called him or actually he called me the second the, the plane crashed and i got out i was getting a phone call for him because on his phone he had an app that showed him his uh the emergency locating transmitter had gone off and so he's calling me the second I'm walking out of the plane. I'm like, have you already heard what's going on? He's like, no, but I just got a notification that the ELT went on. I go, well, we just lost power and we landed in the field. And he's like, oh, crap, are you guys all right? He said, yeah. And he said, oh, I'm heading over there. So he came and so he came and helped us get it out. And there were quite a few people there helping. And we just hooked it up to a, uh, we hooked it up to a tractor, lifted the front end, and we just dragged it out of the field. So you, do you lease it from him? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I get that right. And you used the word crash, and I want to be sensitive to the appropriate language and not tick people off. Yeah. It's safe to say that the plane crashed in the farm field? Because I have never said it yet. I didn't know if we called yeah. it an emergency. I mean, it's really up to you. We were laughing about that earlier because she, she, said, she said, I said, uh, prepare for crash landing. And I said, I think I said emergency, and our daughter-in-law was like, crash emergency like what's uh, oh i feel much better it's just an emergency so she was laughing but um uh I, yeah i think it i just uh, yeah so i mean it's it was a controlled crash landing how about that i wouldn't call it a crash but it was a power out landing i guess you know like i knew where i was going with it and you know i was just hoping that it all worked out good and it, we we did luck out a lot there were, we had a lot of things that could have been different so everything just kind of lined up perfectly for us, I feel like. Right on. Um, your first name is Chris, C-H-R-I-S. Mm -hmm. And your last name is Prophet, P-R-O-F. I-T-T. I-T-T. Mm -hmm. It's pronounced Prophet. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, can you think of anything? We're blessed to be alive. Yeah. I mean, that's all I can say. Can't wait for the plane to get out and go flying again. No. I am. The funny thing about it, yeah, it's like uh, you'd almost think that... Um, you know, you'd be afraid to fly again when something like that happens to you. Or, and uh, I actually feel 
more confident now in flying because I've been through it, you know, because as a pilot, you're always wondering, like, how am I going to react to this? If this ever happens, am I going to be able to get the plane down or am I going to freak out and do something stupid, you know? And you never know until it happens to you. And so the fact that it happened and I probably didn't do everything perfect, you know, I don't know if you can when you're in that situation, but I did the best that I could do. And I think I felt good about the fact that I was calm, didn't, I didn't freak out and just did what I had to do and it worked out. So it gives me a little bit more confidence. You know, if that ever was to happen again, at least I know, hey, I know how I re reacted before. So it just gives you that knowledge and now you know how you're going to react. It brings me back to that moment prior to this interview starting. Your wife shared that she has her headphones on. She's not hearing anything. Um, you, you, you just have to react. You're in react mode and deal with it mode. Yeah. There's an emotional reaction of great uncertainty here, but you're task focused. Yeah, and I wasn't giving her much comfort because <laughs> she was screaming, what, "What's going on? What's going on?" And you know, I, I don't even think I answer her. I was just, I was just like, "You were just doing don't talk right now." Yeah, I was just concentrated, and it was almost like she wasn't even there. Like, I was just uh, so focused in on what was going on. It's almost like, a, it's almost kind of surreal when you think about it, because uh, I just remember going, I can't, this is not happening right now, but I can't believe that this is actually freaking happening. I'm going to end up in this field. You know, it's almost, it's hard to, it's hard to believe, actually. Especially after all the years I've been flying, it's never, I've never had any problem. And so I'm just like kind of blown away by it. This is really happening right now. <laughs> yeah. It was more of disbelief for me than fear, yeah. you know, whereas for her, she was just, you know, really uh, very, very afraid. So I had 40 seconds to prepare for a crash landing. Yeah, yeah. She didn't know what to expect. So I, I think it's different as a pilot because you train for this kind of stuff. You know what it's going to be like. You know, you should know what it's going to be like and. So it's not a surprise to a pilot so much as it is some somebody who doesn't really like planes and then they're coming down and they're, you know, I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like, but I'm imagining it was probably pretty, pretty scary, yeah. you know, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's fantastic that you guys made it. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing your yeah, story. Well, this is awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for coming by. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hi, this is Mark Horner. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you like this type of content, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. If you do subscribe, hit the bell button so you'll get a notification when I upload a new video or go live. Also, a special shout out to those of you who support Beyond 90 Seconds on Patreon. Thank you, Tracy Newcomer, Noreen Farrar, and Texas Ryder. If you'd like more information about supporting Beyond 90 Seconds on Patreon, check out the link in the description below.